good evening uh, everybody uh, uh, we are very happy to announce uh, uh, the first lecture of uh, uh, the webinar series of archaeological uh, sciences center iit gandhinagar uh, to start with i would uh, request professor michel danino to introduce the webinar and the background about this uh, lecture series Namaste, good afternoon, everybody, and um, welcome to this first lecture in the webinar series of Archaeological Sciences Center at IIT Gandhinagar. This center was created in 2012, um, basically to help the archaeological research in India to make best use of uh, recent scientific and technological developments that can uh, help archaeologists in extracting much more data from uh, the, the excavated materials that they collect or from, uh, from uh, archaeological sites themselves. So uh, we've had a number of projects and activities and we have three resident archaeologists at the moment uh, in the center and a number of research projects are going on. Uh, we realize that there is a great need to keep the public at large better informed of such developments, such new findings in all um, branches of archaeology, from environmental archaeology to um, uh, all the specialized uh, branches. And we're planning to have for at least a year, if not two, this monthly series where we are inviting the very best experts in the fields who will tell us about developments on the Indian subcontinent as a whole and uh, new findings. And uh, apart from providing uh, this, this welcome information, it, the one effect will also be uh, to help dispel a number of uh, misunderstandings or some confusion in the public mind uh, that uh, often arises from uh, you know, imperfect or incomplete media reports. So uh, this is... Uh, brief introduction to the entire series and uh, please keep in touch with the, our website um, uh, and also uh, and register so that we keep your references and we will inform you uh, about all the other lectures uh, which normally will happen on, on a Saturday, the last Saturday of every month. <coughs> so uh, this is uh, about the series as a whole. Now I request uh, Dr. Provaka to introduce the speaker for today, our very distinguished Professor Ravi Kurisita. Thank you, uh, Professor Michel. Uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction of this webinar series. So as introduced by uh, Professor Michel, we will be uh, having uh, one speaker per month to introduce various recent, recent researchers. And we have today with us Professor Ravi Kurisita. Uh, of course, he doesn't need any uh, introduction, but for those uh, uh, who know less about him. He is one of the leading uh, archaeologists in the country or in the entire uh, uh, international scenario who has worked extensively on the prehistoric uh, archaeology of India and South Asia. Uh, so his, uh, his work particularly in the uh, Jalapuram region, the Karnul uh, region is remarkable for understanding various facets of the uh, early human occupation in, in that particular region and also to have a holistic understanding of how human dispersals happened in the, in the past. So before uh, wasting much time, I would request uh, Professor Ravi Kodisaka to deliver the uh, first lecture of this uh, series. Sir, go to you, sir. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Prabhakar. Thank you, Dr. Michel, and also Dr. Sharada for this opportunity. I remember it is almost a month ago, Prabhakar, uh, you know, approached me to be part of this particular program starting on 30th or 31st of October or so. I could not say no. By then, I was I was becoming more and more familiar familiar with this uh, you know webinar presentations uh, 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 hosted by several organizations as well as being part of this uh, ongoing refresher course for the assistant archaeologists of the Archaeological Survey of India. So I was enjoying this kind of interaction with um, you know varieties of scholars and as well as students and so on. In the process, I was also learning a lot. And then when I suggested that I can talk on this particular problem of out of Africa, and uh, after having said yes, I realized the you know 
enormous amount of literature that is there and number of issues being debated in respect of uh, out of africa models that are you know being discussed across the globe i was wondering what to do and how can i you know present a simplified version because he said it is about 60 minutes of uh, presentation and 30 minutes of uh, uh, question and answer session and so on uh, somehow i uh, you know i took uh, a decision and also thought that I should have uh, a topic which will of course present uh, in very very general terms not getting into the multiple details of uh, you know, technical aspects of the arguments that are going on um, and also uh, this is an occasion as uh, uh, Prabhaka mentioned just now that we have done a lot of work at Jalapuram area and that is one uh, investigation that was carried out for about uh, seven or eight years has contributed to much more you know intense debate uh, that ensued since the publication of one of our papers way back in 2007 so uh, i thought i should uh, in the beginning talk in terms of uh, generalities and then focus uh, uh, attention on what evidence that we have with respect to out of africa uh, dispersal of uh, hominins either during the first phase that is generally known as out of africa one or during our second phase that is associated with the expansion of modern humans uh, out of africa uh, that is out of africa too and then i also see the multiple you know out of africa models coming up one after the other and uh, each one has its own criteria and uh, also uh, a set of arguments that are nearly convincing and so on. I do not know how many more out of Africa models will be there in the near future because this is a never ending area of uh, research that is going on in different parts of the world. And each time um, there is a new discovery, um, it leads to a kind of game changing situation wherein we have to revise all our you know, current understanding and so on. So I thought I'll make a presentation which will be very, very general because I was told it's going to be a wide variety of uh, audience and it cannot be too archaeological or too you know technical in that sense <clears throat> uh, some preliminaries to begin with um, as i as i see during the last 40 years uh, this particular topic of origins and uh, dispersal of modern humans out of africa uh, these modern humans are also known as anatomically moderns they are also known as anatomic modern homo sapiens and so on it has become a hot topic uh, uh, and particularly uh, amongst uh, Paleolithic archaeologists at a global level. And uh, this uh, topic picked up a great deal as one of the fifth big questions being addressed by archaeologists ever since, you know, some of these issues relating to human origins, cultural, biological evolution, and then peopling of the planet. And uh, several of these fact aspects have been dealt with from time to time. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, issues... Uh, they crop up again and again. Sometimes they become very, very cool and then reemerge as very hot topics because of uh, the discoveries, new discoveries and methods that are being developed by archaeologists the world over. And a lot of scientists are involved, uh, particularly in the study of, uh, uh, you know, human origins and their dispersal out of Africa. How do we consider dispersal, you know, as a concept? Uh, is it an adaptive strategy? Uh, is it uh, uh, or is it uh, a, you know a response it's a behavioral response of human populations uh, in the event of calamity demographic pressure etc cetera, etc cetera. and then is it because uh, it is an inherent behavior of humans uh, to range beyond their habitats you see that also amounts to you know expansion from their habitats or frontiers and so on we see right from the beginning um, as early as the lower paleolithic times we see that uh, humans have been expanding their ranging habits, particularly in search of productive land landscapes or uh, productive geographical environments, be it lithic raw material resources or other subsistence resources and so on. Uh, and we also see um, that, uh, you know, uh, expansion uh, initially takes place from localized sources and within the region where the initial origin origins take place and then gradually go beyond the particular region, beyond the cut across the frontiers of that particular natural habitat where these origins took place and so on. Since the publication of uh, the seminal paper by Can et al. in Nature in 1985, uh, this discussion, this topic on 
modern human origins uh, and then they disperse a lot of africa and then several of these theories like replacement theories or multiple uh, origins theory uh, have been um, you know uh, amongst us for quite some time uh, although some people claim that both the theories weigh uh, enough uh, have enough weight to carry and then we cannot dismiss either of them so easily and so on but uh, the research is following 1985 has contributed to application of uh, <clears throat> you know, new dating methods and uh, also arriving at provocative conclusions from genetic studies, technological analysis of lithic assemblages, and also new discoveries of hominins, uh, not only in the well-known uh, geographical environments, even in new geographical areas, which were not previously known to, known to be hominin sites uh, at all. So such of these developments uh, is, is as a result of intensity of research that is going on and the realization of the fact that you know, different geographical areas across the world have potential for you know, penetrating back in time to be able to identify sites and then you know, test these hypotheses, whether so it's multi-regional hypothesis, you know, <clears throat> Africa-centric hypothesis and such things. Uh, our status of knowledge is based on ongoing research. And if I am saying anything, it is based on research what has happened till now. And uh, there is so much scope for updating ourselves. Uh, you know, every day there is a new publication which is challenging in our knowledge that we have already had with us. So both modern humans uh, or modern, uh, modern humans as well as ancients, uh, especially uh, the colonization, by modern humans during the last uh, thousand years or so uh, during the late middle paleolithic or early late paleolithic if we use uh, very non non committing uh, terminologies uh, otherwise they use the terms like late stone age middle stone age upper paleolithic middle paleolithic and so on but in simple terms uh, these are uh, you know, successive stages in the development of uh, paleolithic uh, culture uh, and we see these developments are associated with the expansion of uh, you know, these populations beyond the focal area into newer geographical environments, finally leading to the peopling of the entire planet or so. So wherever possible, uh, integrated paleoanthropological, uh, geochronological ancient DNA and behavioral reconstructions from material culture records have been at the forefront of archeological or paleolithic archeology. span I being an archeologist, uh, not, uh, uh, primarily trained in uh, biological archaeology or biological anthropology or genetics, I would like to you know emphasize more on our own uh, you know cultural raw material cultural remains contributing to uh, <clears throat> delineating the processes uh, giving rise to expansion of populations out of Africa, focusing on the timing of their expansion into the Indian subcontinent at various points of time, during the time of lower Paleolithic, during the time of middle Paleolithic, and of course, even if later expansion events were also there, we'd like to identify them. It is also noted that unlike Africa, not all geographical regions across the world reveal uniform evidence uh, uh, of all time periods and uh, of all aspects of, uh, you know, uh, that are essential for reconstructing uh, a holistic reconstruction of uh, the processes uh, uh, behind uh, the colonization events and so on. So even in Africa, such a huge uh, you know, continent, um, you know, the, unique, the, the, the kind of archeological sites, the, the archeological context do not give us uh, you know, uniform uh, data sets or uniform uh, you know, evidences uh, uh, within Africa itself. And it is not surprising if we find these discrepancies and lack of preservation of essential uh, data, uh, data sets for reconstruction even outside uh, uh, you know, the African continent. There are various factors controlling these, you know, the preservation of evidence that are essential for making a comprehensive reconstruction and so on. But in the last decade and a half, uh, significant developments in dating and the study of lithic technological characteristics of assemblages uh, from variety of uh, you know, paleolithic context in India has certainly contributed to the behavioral reconstructions, especially the emergence of uh, behavioral modernity in uh, you know, homo sapiens and also uh, the timing of out of Africa colonization of the Indian, uh, 
uh, colonization of the Indian subcontinent by both ancient and moderns and so on. So if we can, uh, if we do, if we look at the dispersals and uh, how dispersal dispersal can be viewed by archaeologists and paleoanthropologists and so on. So paleo would say that it is uh, an adaptive behavior in the event of calamity, demographic pressure, uh, climatic forcing, and things like that. Uh, we also would like to look at this uh, dispersal as an as a, a, a natural behavior in uh, hominins, be it uh, you know very anatomically modern in ancients or moderns and so on. And then, uh, as I said, uh, in search of uh, suitable raw materials, uh, there is evidence in archaeological context that uh, the ranging habits went anywhere between five kilometers to 100 kilometers from the base camp and the things like that. And uh, so, so productive landforms were another uh, you know, important factor attracting these populations to expand into newer geographical areas and so on. And of course, we have seen uh, that, uh, you know, hominin settlements outside of Africa, in Europe, in, uh, you know, in, in age, different parts of Asia and so on. Uh, oh, yes, correct. So what, what could have been an alternative explanation to these uh, dispersal events? What triggered the dispersal of hominins? not only you know, beyond, uh, from Eastern Africa into other parts of Africa, and of course, beyond Africa into other areas of uh, the old world, which we consider the region of uh, continents, three continents, Africa, Europe, Asia, which are contiguous and they're, they're interconnected by land routes and so on. And in all these three continental areas, we have uh, a network of uh, these settlements dating from the lower Paleolithic onwards. And their chronology may differ from one region to another region and so on. But uh, in the mid latitude regions of Europe, we see that, uh, you know, the grasslands were much more productive, uh, uh, productive uh, geographical environments, which attracted uh, you know, human populations. And then this, uh, you know, in, in, in these areas, uh, biomass uh, uh, productivity, secondary biomass and, uh, you know, primary biomass, um, are very, very important factors which provide uh, you know, subsistence uh, you know, assurance to these hominins who colonize these new areas and so on. So dispersal is a, a phenomenon which is very, very natural, not only to humans, but we, we have seen this happening you know, to all other members of the animal kingdom. Uh, but we, our concern Rob, right now is the way in which human populations uh, you know, uh, have been found across the planet and during the course of uh, the time from early Paleolithic time onwards. So what we see here in this particular slide is, uh, you know, during the last uh, 40 years or so, there have been so many of these discoveries related to uh, related to Homo habilis fossils, which we consider now as one of the earliest, uh, you know, cultural, you know, human ancestor. But of course, in the last 15, 20 years or so, we have come across even older you know, hominin fossils. And there is a possibility that they were also, you know, tool, tool makers and so on. Uh, and of course, uh, the early oldest tools were dated to about 2.6 million years for a very, very long time. But with the discovery of, uh, you know, Lomekwi uh, in Kenya, uh, it has been pushed back even to, you know, 3.3 million years ago onwards. Yet, you know, despite the fact that uh, hominid fossils have been found not only in Africa and also outside of Africa, during the 40 years, beginning 1960 to till now, uh, till about 20 years ago, we see that the oldest uh, hominin fossils, especially of the Homo habilis, uh, who is the who is credited with the, with the invention of World War I technology or Mode One technology, are the oldest in Africa even today. So, given the situation, uh, uh, the fact that Homo habilis fossils have not been found outside of Africa. And the fact that the typical old one artifact assemblages have not been found out of Africa, although uh, there are suggestions that uh, you know the the artifact assemblages have their own regional uh, you know, variation, and uh, it is an adaptive uh, mechanism as well. Uh, but the chronology, as such, uh, gives us a clear idea that the oldest sites are in Africa, and uh, the sites outside of Africa are much younger in time, and that is why perhaps that is the underlying. Uh, you know, criterion uh, to to develop this particular out of Africa models that have been uh, discussed. Uh, next one, well, I can't change. <laughs> no problem. Yes, yes, right. 
So here we have, we have these, uh, you know, East African Rift, uh, you know, Ethiopia, Somalia, Kenya, Tanzania, and these areas, Rift Valley and the Lake Turkana uh, area, we have these oldest sites uh, of uh, or early Ashulian as well as older one sites. Older one uh, assemblages are referred to as Modwan and Ashulian, early Ashulian or Ashulian phase uh, artifact assemblages are called Mod 2. And then the middle, middle Stone Age or Middle Paleolithic uh, assemblages are called Mod 3, and then Microliths or Late Stone Age are called Mod 4, and so on. So, uh, looking at these sites in Eastern Africa, uh, and the fact that the oldest sites are here, and the sites outside of Africa are younger in time, uh, so it is possible to, you know, source these populations out of Africa to Africa. An initial expansion within Africa and the Sub Saharan Africa and then move northwards uh, you know, uh, into, into southern Europe and then northeastwards into Arabia and then further uh, east into South Asia and further east into East Asia and so on. So this is one reason why uh, you know, these out of Africa models have a good chronological uh, you know, base to argue for continuing, argue for uh, continuous expansions taking place ever since they began to move out of Africa and so on. So um, this particular state statement looks uh, very, very meaning, uh, meaningful to me in the particular context, uh, because from their localized African origins, humans have come to live all over the world, and that can only have happened as a result of dispersals. So this is the source, and then as gradually you have these migrations taking place across the contiguous continental areas and then entering into the New World, Australia and the Americas, and then so many of these, uh, you know, islands which are yet to be colonized by modern humans. Next one. So again, uh, stone tools from Chinese sites like here, we have uh, the date going back to 2.1 million years. But even in Eastern Asia, we have these older dates. Uh, they are all associated with the distinctive stone tool uh, assemblages, uh, not directly actually comparable to those found in Africa and elsewhere in South Asia and so on. And then there are interesting uh, in those situations wherein we have you know, very early settlements going down to lower Pleistocene, even in Africa, uh, even in Europe, Southern Europe and you know, Caucasus, uh, Georgia, and those areas. Uh, a large number of sites have been found in different parts of um, you know, Africa, uh, sorry, Europe, and then also in Eastern and you know, Southern Asia and so on. Uh, and this extent of the oldest settlements uh, ranging in time uh, from the lower Pleistocene, base of the lower Pleistocene to later part of the Pleistocene have been documented from outside of uh, Africa. And uh, the older ones are uh, found in this region as well as uh, Ashulian sites are found in uh, this particular area, uh, Israel and so on, and then further westwards into Iberia and Spain and so on, southeastwards into you know, Indonesia and uh, so sites like Sangiran uh, are very well known sites. Uh, these dates may not be the exact dates that we know, um, but when these uh, charts were prepared, the dates have been revised now, the older the, the, the dates have been revised, and then they appear to be even older than what they were known to us. So this is that uh, uh, old world, and then uh, the major expansion of, uh, you know, uh, Hashulian hominins taking place from out of Africa. And these uh, geographical environments uh, provide us you know, consistent evidence about the presence of uh, humans during the lower Pleistocene itself. In, uh, in India, uh, in uh, you know, Southwest Asia, in a major part of Eastern and Central Africa and Southern Africa and so on. And with occasional sites uh, like those uh, reported from Georgia and so on. Uh, there are uh, you know, reasons uh, and also factors responsible for uh, the presence of some older sites in this area and they have been interpreted in a different way. And what we see is out of Africa one, the, the proposition that Homo erectus originated in East Africa and colonized Asia in the early Pleistocene has been useful way of making sense of a large set of late Pleistocene and early Pleistocene fossil hominins and archeological data from East Africa. The previous slide also indicated the post you know, the, the nature of sites, you know, being much older and older in Eastern Africa and Central Africa and so on. And a very small amount of early Pleistocene evidence from Asia and also Southern Europe. Uh, that is what we have to notice. Uh, the intensity of occupation, um, you know, outside of Africa 
uh, either in southern africa either in southern europe or in southern asia uh, is not reflected very well uh, in the in the in the sites that have been mapped and investigated and very well dated and so on so according to this model the genus homo and the species homo erectus both originated in africa as did tool making and many of our other skills needed to survive in the drier and more strongly seasonal conditions that became more widespread in the late pliocene um, and early pleistocene and so on so if these are the conditions in which these uh, human expansions occurred in prehistory uh, there may be other factors to explain the presence of uh, older sites older sites outside of africa during the in the lower pleistocene next one So, Australian expansion out of Africa uh, has given us, uh, you know, identifying these uh, geographical provinces of distinctive uh, lithic assemblages. So, East Asian chopper chopping tool complex, and then you have various non Australian assemblages uh, coming from, you know, eastern part of Eurasia, uh, sorry, western part of Eurasia, and then major part of uh, eastern Eurasia, and so on. So, you have the Australian uh, tradition province covered by much larger area. And then these two provinces have uh, restricted geographical and so on. So there is direct relationship between uh, these cultural developments and expansion events um, between Africa and you know, South Asia, the Indian subcontinent in particular. So these differences in lithic assemblages are attributed to you know, adaptation to these local environment and so on. And uh, uh, the, the use of the term mode one, uh, you know, uh, facilitates a uh, clear uh, understanding of uh, the regional variation in the way in which early hominin colonization is reflected in the archaeological record. Next. So look at this particular map uh, where you know, initial African holder exodus may have taken place uh, even before Homo erectus uh, you know, invented a Shulin technology and had developed greater adaptive skills to be able to range beyond Africa and so on. But some of the sites uh, below uh, 45 degrees latitude, uh, 40 or 45 below uh, you know, degree latitude in Southern Africa uh, are considered uh, very important sites uh, to be able to uh, you know, uh, extend the, the first expansion out of Africa even beyond uh, you know, the Acheulean times. So that is reflected in the evidence from the sites like Damnesi, which is dated to about 1.8 million years or so. Now, this particular reason why it attracted these early expansion of hominins is also attributed to the presence of, uh, you know, uh, productive, uh, uh, what we call grasslands or so productive grasslands, which were uh, very, very attractive. And then they gave us, you know, uh, perennial subsistence resources uh, available for these early hominins and so on. So because of some of these evidence focusing on Damnesi, it is now suggested that early hominin presence in Europe can be traced back to almost 2 million years with the Damnesi hominin fossils found in Georgian Transcaucasus, well dated to about 1.8 million years ago. The four hominin skulls and their four mandibles are found in association with simple mode one lithic artifacts. They are non-diagnostic, neither they are old one nor they are Acheulean. So that is why the use of the term mode one makes sense here. And the cranial material shows affinities with African Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis. So, giving uh, you know a clue to the fact that perhaps uh, um, you know the foretelling the emergence of Homo erectus in East Asia. We have Homo erectus in East Asia going back to 1.8 million years, years, and perhaps uh, this was the one uh, species who migrated before Homo erectus evolved in Africa, and perhaps uh, you know Afri you know, Homo erectus went back to Africa and also spread you know, eastwards up to Southeast Asia and so on. Next. So this is another rifle hypothesis uh, to the canonical one that Homo erectus originated in Africa and was the first hominin to dis disperse into Asia. The alternative proposition is that Homo erectus originated in Asia from uh, a population of Homo that dispersed out of Africa before 1.8 million years ago. And some of these Asian populations of early Homo erectus then disperse back into Eastern Africa and then eastwards into so East Asia and so on, so especially Java and so on. So this, uh, that is one reason why um, 
the trinoma like you know homo erectus georgicus homo erectus ergaster in africa and homo erectus erectus in uh, you know southeast asia and so on so perhaps this was one reason where a region where the the ancestors of homo erectus lived and that can be associated with the evidence that has been produced from the site of uh, the amnesian related sites and so on and even out of africa yeah so this is the popular uh, and uh, you know paradigm that, that we have for the initial expansion out of africa and for a very very long time until about uh, 10 years ago we did not have uh, you know well well dated uh, early paleolithic sites here anywhere in india also there are some sites which indicated uh, the presence of uh, you know human settlements comparable to you know uh, damnisi in rivat and uh, <coughs> pabi hills in pakistan uh, but then again uh, the assemblages uh, reflecting upon the presence of hominins is also non diagnostic so mold one uh, you know assemblages have been identified there the work of uh, robert denell helen rendell and of course the british archaeological mission to pakistan uh, has contributed to the you know the presence of sites as early as 1.8 to 2.2 million years ago so some of these uh, you know isolated uh, very uh, uh, ancient sites uh, prior to the emergence of uh, distinctive ashulian uh, you know ashulian ashulian settlements uh, across south asia we have these uh, you know highly dispersed uh, evidence uh, suggesting uh, pre erectus migration out of africa uh, at the center of origin is still to be debated because the, the evidence at hand is suggestive of the fact that uh, even homo habilis pre erectus habilis may have also gradually uh, you know expanded out of africa and so on but there are multiple theories and multiple ways of looking at it whether the damnisi uh, you know hominin assemblies gave rise to later homo erectus which went back to africa and then went eastwards into asia and so on or uh, you know uh, how homo habilis itself uh, had expanded beyond uh, into this particular into georgia and so on so uh, we have these older dates uh, even in china and a couple of more sites even dating back to 2.1 million years are also known from you know china and so on so uh, some of these dates are suggestive of the fact that as early as the lower pleistocene uh, many of these areas which were generally considered as uh, uh, regions where hominin expansion only occurred during the later part of the lower pleistocene and early part of uh, <coughs> the middle pleistocene have also now given as evidence but um, you know the lack of uh, follow up work is one thing which has given rise to very sparse nature of uh, distribution of sites which are older than uh, 1.6 million years 1.7 million years and so on next one so why <clears throat> i chose this topic against this background it is time for us to think uh, in terms of uh, the nature of archaeological research uh, into the earliest settlements in the indian subcontinent so the early paleolithic or mode 1 and mode 2 technology um, you know <clears throat> uh, related settlements as i mentioned briefly they are found in the indian subcontinent of course now indian subcontinent you know uh okay is divided into pakistan and uh, india but otherwise in in the context of paleolithic archaeology it is it is better to look at the indian subcontinent as one geographical unit and we see the presence of mode one assemblages uh, in northwest pakistan northwestern part of the indian subcontinent uh, those sites in rewat and pabi hill areas and also a large number of sites uh, uh, uh representing mode two assemblages having been on right from pakistan to as far south as at tempakam in southern india and so on so there is evidence for a pre pre erectus presence of uh, you know hominins in the indian subcontinent and overwhelming evidence of uh, erectus homo erectus uh, you know and post erectus uh, settlements in the indian subcontinent so the work of randall and danell it was again published in 1985 uh, and they did extensive work on the collection of artifacts from uh, these two sites and then they ca categorized these artifacts as mode 1 assemblages but then what i mentioned uh, you know the problem of uh, you know follow up work and then uh, the lack of uh, you know uh, you know sites you know uh, that can be compared with those which were discovered by this particular team in that in that region or elsewhere in the indian subcontinent uh, <clears throat> or whether the northwestern part of the indian subcontinent 
forms an entirely ge a geographical unit where you know where uh, the sites of Domnesi and other related sites can be you know put together. And then following this, uh, uh, it has remained in solitude and continues to remain in solitude until uh, we find more sites representing the kind of uh, you know <clears throat> assemblages uh, reported by this particular uh, paper in current anthropology. Uh, in addition to that, we have this paper uh, by K. Padaya, uh, published uh, back in two, 2002. Of course, uh, the publication came uh, in 2002, but earlier there were brief uh, references to the dates for the site of Isampur in, uh, in, uh, in peninsular South India, uh, going back to about 1.2 million years. Yet, this paper remained in solitude for a very, very long time. And the date for this particular uh, you know, site of Isampur was also not, uh, you know, uh, referred to uh, more frequently as it was expected because it was one of the oldest dates for the Ashulin in southern India. Because for a very, very long time, as I mentioned in the beginning, all of our early Ashulian sites were considered to be uh, post Jaramillo event or post uh, Bruns Matayama boundary. Uh, but this site uh, certainly gave uh, very clear uh, evidence of uh, date going back to lower Pleistocene at the upper end of the lower Pleistocene, no doubt. But still, a lower Pleistocene presence of hominins uh, could be uh, easily um, <clears throat> identified based on the date and the nature of, uh, you know, Acheulean industry, large cutting uh, tools or the large, large flake Acheulean industry reported from the site of Isampur in South India. Uh, then uh, until about, you know, for a decade, we did not know where to place uh, the Indian lower Paleolithic until this particular paper by uh, Shanti Papu et al was published in Science uh, way back in 2011. And where she had uh, a wonderful you know, <clears throat> argument to claim for an early Pleistocene presence of Ashulian hominins in South India based on her work at Athirampakkam and uh, in application of uh, the dating aluminum, beryllium dating um, you know, method. And then uh, it was put to rigor test. The fact that it was published in the journal Science uh, uh, gives a lot of cre credit and also credibility to the date that has been published. So these two papers certainly place the Indian Acheulean uh, in the lower Pleistocene. Uh, the site of uh, Isampur is, goes back to 1.2 million years, whereas Athirampakkam goes back to 1.7 to 1.8 million years. So very early. Uh, not there is not much time gap between East Africa and early Acheulean and the Indian Acheulean reported from Athirampakkam and so on. So it again reflects upon very rapid expansion out of Africa by the Homo erectus populations. And then we have these more three assemblages coming from equally large number of sites across the Indian subcontinent. And wherever we have early Paleolithic sites, we invariably also have uh, the Middle Paleolithic or Middle Stone Age sites, uh, you know, in India. And then, of course, uh, uh, you know, these uh, dates for this Middle Paleolithic were also not uh, known from Indian context. Most of the fluvial context sites had uh, uh, placed this uh, beginning of Middle Paleolithic uh, around 40 to 50,000 years ago onwards. Uh, but the work of, uh, you know, uh, our investigations at Jolapuram for the first time gave an age of uh, 80,000 years for the beginning of Middle Paleolithic in southern India once again in the Jureru River Valley of uh, Karnur district of Andhra Pradesh. And uh, this actually set in motion series of debates about the fact that uh, the Middle Paleolithic, uh, you know, is generally associated with the rise of uh, modern humans in Africa and of course Neanderthals in uh, Western Eurasia and so on. So the fact that the lithic assemblages uh, to Jolapuram were comparable to Middle Stone Age assemblages in Africa uh, this particular uh, date of 80,000 years, uh, you know, the context was found uh, below the volcanic ash, which is dated to about 74,000 years ago, uh, gave us, uh, you know, a, an opportunity to argue for early expansion of hominins, I mean, modern humans out of Africa into the Indian subcontinent, whether it is 80,000 years or much earlier, and perhaps going back to the base of uh, oxygen isotopic stages stage five and so on, 1,25,000 years ago onwards. Uh, and then uh, this, uh, the results of this uh, you know, discovery and the uh, dating were published again in the journal Science way back in 2007. And that set in motion this debate about uh, you know, the timing of uh, expansion out of Africa by anatomically modern Homo sapiens, whether it was uh, you know, associated with the uh, Middle Paleolithic 
uh, first or whether it was associated with uh, microlithic first because it was it is generally argued that uh, modern human expansion out of africa into the indian subcontinent coincided with the invention of microlithic technology and then following a southerly route they gradually colonized the indian subcontinent between uh, post you know toba uh, time that is post 74000 years and it is also supported by genetic studies and so they suggest uh, uh, this model suggests a younger date for hominin expansion modern human expansion into the indian subcontinent even geneticists also suggest that uh, it does not go uh, beyond 60000 years uh, ago so that is one reason and subsequently uh, a very very strong paper published by kumar akhilesh et al uh, uh, from athirampakkam uh, you know gave us uh, a surprising date of about 385000 years to 172000 years time bracket for the, the you know the temporal span of the middle paleolithic uh, succeeding you know uh, early paleolithic late ashurian at site of athirampakkam and so on and this again uh, you know started uh, you know contributing to even intense debate about the validity of out of africa too which is based on either uh, you know comparability of middle paleolithic assemblages uh, with african ones and uh, the indian ones or at the same time looking at the convergence of technologies or early uh, you know late uh, uh, early development of middle paleolithic associated with archaic homo sapiens and then at some point of time uh, even african middle stone age hominin populations also gradually entered uh, into the indian subcontinent there are multiple ways of looking at these divergent dates that we have so at particular site of athirampakkam the time range for the middle paleolithic is uh, 3 lakh 85000 to 1 lakh 72000 years ago whereas here at uh, jolapuram uh, in andhra pradesh we have uh, the older date going back to about 78 to 80000 years ago to about 35000 years ago where we see transition towards uh, microlithization and so on and then uh, this particular paper by uh, you know the clarkson et al discusses and uh, tries to figure out uh, you know the, the 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 manner in which these two models either a middle paleolithic first model or microlithic first model uh, which are based on cogent arguments um, you know uh, substantiate the argument whether you know hominin of modern human uh, expansion into the indian subcontinent occurred during the middle paleolithic times or not next one so uh, late paleolithic uh, that is associated with microlithic uh, you know assemblages or microlithic technology uh, you know is associated with oas4 the end of uh, uh, oxygen isotope stage 5 and the beginning of oxygen isotopic stage 4 and that also coincides with the post toba event uh, taking place uh but this dates for the microliths in india is very very young in the sense they are not older than about 48000 years because uh, even before uh, some of the sites were uh, you know dated to about 48000 in the indian subcontinent uh, we have uh, evidence from sri lanka arguing for much older uh, dates for the microlithic uh, you know technologies associated with modern human settlements in sri lanka now this is one of the recent papers i am referring to here where we have uh, you know the previously the site of fahian le the lena was dated to about 38000 years but it has gone backwards in time by about 10 more thousand years to dating to 48000 years or so so this uh, there was a consistency in the way in which these microlithic uh, you know settlements in Afri in in sri lanka were dated whereas in the indian subcontinent there was one one publication uh, referring to an early microlithic uh, you know phase um, which was described uh, as part of the upper paleolithic sequence at a site called patne by uh, sali uh, in the tapi valley but again this paper had remained in solitude for a very very long time until the microliths uh, at jolapuram 9 rock shelter were dated to about 35000 greater older than 35000 years ago and so and uh, in subsequently uh, the work of uh, uh, shila mishra at mehta gedi also uh, gave us uh, you know even uh, older date for the micro this year this is all in good conformity with the dates that we have for the microliths in uh, in sri lanka as well in different parts of uh, the indian peninsula uh, these works in eastern india uh, ayodhya hills by uh, pishnupriya basak also 
have uh, pushed the antiquity of microliths back to 45,000 years ago. Even again, here there are issues, whether it is independent evolution of microliths or it is uh, you know, a transition from late middle paleolithic to early uh, late stone age or early microlithic and so on, or it is convergence of technology. So these are some of the you know, perspectives uh, in which uh, these assemblages and the dates need to be taken into account to arrive at some meaningful conclusion about the antiquity of microliths um, and their relationship with populations coming out of Africa into the Indian subcontinent. So this is again another paper which summarizes uh, the, the status of information that is available on uh, the microlithic sites and their antiquity in the Indian subcontinent and also looks at the possible scenarios that how these interpretation, these data sets can be interpreted and so on. Next. So this table summarizes, uh, you know, the various claims that are being made uh, based on archaeological research, multidisciplinary archaeological research. Unfortunately, none of the sites that have been uh, referred to till now have you given us evidence of, uh, you know, hominin fossils. That is one major shortcoming in Indian prehistoric archaeology, and we have to primarily depend on uh, the material cultural remains uh, and also the context, which can be very securely dated and so on. So given the, the flexibility of uh, you know, the dates and the opportunities that are available for us to argue uh, and you know, suggest new ways of looking at the data sets that are available for Indian archaeologists, uh, this table uh, summarizes uh, you know, the way in which uh, different uh, scholars have been looking at the kind of evidence at their disposal, including the dates that they have produced for the sites they have investigated. So the middle, middle uh, the microlithic first model uh, suggests uh, the date of earliest anatomically modern humans uh, going back to about uh, you know uh, 69,000 years onwards post you know uh, post Toba uh, and uh, you know the MIS four and MIS three uh, you know is the time period uh, where the climate also transition takes place from very cold, dry to warm and humid and so on. So from about 70,000 years ago upwards in time. And so it is the post-Toba uh, event in, uh, you know, as far as this microlithic first model, uh, you know, advocates. And then we have the middle paleolithic first model, which suggests that uh, the early entry of modern humans into the Indian subcontinent coinciding with the onset of late quaternary or uh, the uh, upper part of uh, <clears throat> the lower, lower end of uh, EMIS-5 uh, going back to 1,25,000 years ago onwards. And uh, of course, uh, they were there before the Soba eruption, and then they survived the Soba eruption as well. And uh, two-stage, uh, you know, uh, dispersal model propounded by Dr. Sheila Mishra is also, uh, you know, uh, in support of this human expansion uh, taking place in, during the MIS-4 stage and so on. And then the Indian stage dispersal model, as suggested by Michael Haslam and et al. paper, which I referred to recent, uh, previously, also suggests uh, MIS-4. So we are, uh, we are a team working uh, uh, from different perspectives. Uh, all of us are involved uh, in, in advocating for both the middle paleolithic first and microlithic first, and also Indian stage dispersal model and so on. So given the freedom that we have to, you know, uh, go, you know, involve ourselves in intellectual debates, it has been possible to, you know, revisit our own uh, understanding and then publish uh, fresh, fresh understandings and so on and so forth. Uh, and then you have colonization roots of dispersal is another uh, you know, important aspect of the debate that is going on, whether it was a dispersal along the coastal routes or dispersal along the northern route and so on. So some of them have been suggesting southern coastal routes and southern riverine routes and then through uh, Central Asia and then uh, <clears throat> uh, South Asia and so on, further eastwards into Southeast Asia and then finally reach Australia and so on. And then lithic technology, the microlithic first, certainly the microliths, and then the middle paleolithic or middle stone age, and the timing is middle stone age and MIS-5 onwards. And then you have uh, Indian stage variable, including derived middle stone age and later microlithic and so on. So then accompanying artifacts, in addition to lithic uh, assemblages, we do have some of these objects, uh, you know, shell beads, objects of uh, ornament, what we call symbolic artifacts also. Uh, in the middle Paleolithic, of course, we do not have evidence of objects of ornament, uh, symbolic behavior, and so on. And then even here, it is not specified 
and uh, in this model also it is not known. Technological discontinuity caused by AMHS arrival, it is whether replacing the archaic populations or you know, it is continuation and so on. So between middle paleolithic and microlithic, there is a te technological uh, discontinuity that is uh, you know, very, uh, very clearly seen because uh, during the middle paleolithic, uh, there is a, you know, <clears throat> leads to um, the disuse of uh, large uh, cutting tools like bifaces and uh, you know, uh, cleavers, hand axes and so on. But then uh, there is preference for prepared core technology as well as retouched flakes and so on. And then uh, uh, middle paleolithic first suggests replacement of archaic hominins by anatomically modern humans carrying uh, the middle paleolithic technology and so on. And then the uh, two-stage model also uh, reflect uh, uh, such as such as archaic hominins prevent um, anatomically homin hominins dispersal uh, until uh, this particular time period that is about 70,000 years ago onwards. So interbreeding uh, late survival of archaic hominins uh, in refugia areas like Karnul Basin is one such refugia uh, where you have the continuous uh, you know, sequence of cultures right from the early Paleolithic to modern times as well. And then you have this uh, effect of Toba on these populations, archaic or you know, anatomically modern humans. Uh, in the middle Paleolithic, uh, because stage four, it is post Toba, so naturally none of them were there. During the middle Paleolithic, they were certainly there, but then there is a continuity. Toba did not have, uh, you know, destructive impact on the populations living in this part of the Indian subcontinent. And these are all post-date the Toba eruption. So naturally, hominins, uh, anatomically modern hominins were not present here and so on. So this is in summary, the way in which we look at, um, you know, the evidence that is available for, for archaeologists to organize their data and then uh, you know, reconstruct a story of human expansions right from early Paleolithic to you know, <clears throat> middle Paleolithic to upper Paleolithic uh, and so on. Okay, next. Uh, uh, so as I said, in India, we have uh, very few sites or perhaps there is only one or two sites where we have uh, evidence for uh, hominins, fossils. And there's only one site, group of sites, Satanora and Ethan Kerry sites uh, where we have this famous site of uh, the, the Narmada Calvarium and then associated bones uh, coming from uh, the Narmada uh, formation here. But majority of uh, the known, uh, you know, modern human uh, hominin cells, fossils have been known from Sri Lankan sites like Pahian, Bhatadambalona, and then you have Belilena. And uh, <clears throat> some of these sites have given evidence, but they have not, they have not been dated as yet very very, very conclusively. So the Dolopuram has a time bracket uh, between 25 and 12,000 years, but uh, we have not been able to extract DNA and uh, other other samples uh, from Bibetka or uh, other known sites uh, in India have not been uh, potential for, you know, uh, you know, investigating the ancient DNA <clears throat> component of these particular hominin fossils and so on. But wonderful, you know, research has been going on on the Sri Lankan sites and so on. There are a couple of sites uh, on the northwestern frontiers like Darai Kur uh, in Afghanistan, uh, you know, border area. But then uh, <clears throat> whether they are Neanderthal or Homo sapiens is not very, very clear. So it is necessary for us to not only, you know, for very, very long, we were only worried about establishing chronology of these contexts. Now we have to look for this kind of an additional information and explain why uh, the preservation potential um, of all these archeological sites, which also now have very good dates uh, for uh, human remains is very, very low. And, uh, you know, uh, it is more essential for us to, you know, combined effort, to initiate combined effort to be able to, you know, <clears throat> launch an expedition where we can recover evidence, uh, you know, hominin fossils and so on. Next one. So we have a large number of sites uh, across the uh, Indian Peninsula, apart from those which were reported uh, in this Northwestern Potwar region, uh, right from Rajasthan down south up to the Kaveri Basin, we have widespread distribution of uh, Paleolithic sites. Uh, many, have them, many of them have been investigated, excavated, uh, at the time when there was no such suitable dating methods, but yet uh, we are very clear about the presence of uh, 
primary contact sites across the Indian subcontinent, uh, in central India and in western India and in, uh, major part of southern India and so on. So the best dated sites are here, um, you know, in Tamil Nadu and in Karnataka. Uh, the other sites now need to be uh, reinvestigated for establishing a chronology because we have now good dating methods. YSL dating method is uh, perhaps the most suitable one uh, which can uh, help us uh, you know, <clears throat> establish a better chronology for the Acheulean and Middle Paleolithic, and then of course, uh, upper or microlithic sites across the Indian subcontinent. So there is, uh, you know, from, uh, good chronological control when it comes to dating of the microlithic sites across the Indian subcontinent, although they are very few, it has revealed potential for us, you know, to, to be able to systematically organize, uh, you know, dating expeditions uh, to a number of sites in Eastern India, in Central India, in Western India, and of course, in Southern India and so on. So microliths uh, are likely to be older than 50,000 years in the Indian subcontinent. Um, that is some of the sites, uh, like Mehta Kedi has given us the clue to the fact that the sites can be even older than 50,000. And then even in Southern India, there are many potential rock shelter sites uh, and also revisiting some of the rock shelter sites in central India, especially in the Bimbetka complex, it is likely that uh, some of those microlithic sites which have been uh, identified as Mesolithic sites is likely to be later Pleistocene in age. Next one. So the site of Athirampakham has been uh, dated to 1.5 million years uh, or even more. It may go backwards up to 1.8 million years. And the same site has given a of uh, 3 lakh 85 thousand years for the beginning of uh, you know the middle paleolithic here and then the transition taking place as reflected in the you know in the um, gradual disappearance of large uh, um, you know cutting tools large flake Acheulean artifacts and then appearance of uh, prepared core and then uh, uh, detached flake uh, assemblages uh, so they have a time span uh, it is suggested that there is a gap between the later Acheulean and early middle paleolithic here uh, but yet, the dates that have been uh, you know, produced for this site are very, very important and significant to argue for, you know, <clears throat> uh, a, a, a review a review of uh, the uh, uh, the models that are there advocating the manner in which uh, you know, human expansions out of Africa has taken place, or human expansions may have happened from out of uh, you know India into other parts of the world and so on. Next one. This is another site in the Vindhyas, uh, in the in the Raisai district again. It is, uh, you know, I only have uh, oral information from the excavators that this site also has, uh, you know, lower Pleistocene context, uh, but they have not yet published uh, any uh, scientific article confirming the age of this particular site. It is a massive early Paleolithic site that we you know widespread and uh, associated with the quartzitic landscapes uh, and also pericrete landscapes in this area. We look forward to their findings and then, uh, you know, to be able to figure out if the sites uh, in, in India are as early as lower Pleistocene as, uh, and contemporary with those in Africa and so on. Next one. So this group of sites in the Hunske Valley, as I mentioned in the beginning about the work of uh, Dr. Padaya, uh, this is the Hunske Basin, part of the Hunske Basin, and then as many as 200 Ashulian localities uh, found associated with these uh, landforms, uh, <clears throat> associated with the limestone uh, uh, formation, and uh, uh, very dense distribution uh, in a very small area of about 500 square kilometers um, have yielded uh, excellent uh, you know, primary contact sites. There are a lot of uh, ethnoarchaeological research has gone into it. Uh, you know, understanding site formation processes has also been, uh, you know, gone into it. And then the date for the site of Isampur, uh, uh, going back to 1.2 million years, as I said in the beginning, it was in isolation for some time. Uh, next one. Now it has been supported by older dates from Athiram Pakkam and so on. The site of Isampur is uh, one of the oldest uh, quarry site anywhere in the world that they similar sites are not known even in Africa. And then this is the site where the entire processing sequence, you know, the procurement of raw material to modification of raw materials into various uh, large flakes and then modify them into finished holes can be reconstructed, including refitting of some of the pieces of uh, limestone, uh, you know, <clears throat> can be re refitted here. So here, as many as uh, 
15,000 artifacts have been systematically documented from this site. Next one. Uh, in uh, the blocks of limestone were detached, and then the perimetal flakes were, uh, you know, produced, and these flakes were further modified into various types of finished tools like hand axes, levers, and so on. So, in the context of these artifacts, some of these, uh, you know, animal fossil bones have been subject to ESR dating method. Just because it was an ESR date, and then the problems uh, of uh, the the methodology itself. Uh, the, date, the, the date was not published as early as it was uh, you know, <clears throat> determined, but it, it, it took its own time. And then finally, uh, Professor Padaya decided to publish the date way back in uh, 2002 and so. So this is one of those very primary context Ashulian quarry site uh, known anywhere in India also, anywhere in the world. Next one. So when it comes to modern humans, uh, even in India, as I mentioned, we do, we do have this problem of uh, finding hominin uh, uh, <clears throat> fossils along with the stone tool assemblages or any other material cultural remains. Again, in Africa, we have the oldest evidence of uh, hominin, modern hominins, uh, you know, sometimes uh, not purely homo sapiens, but and having traits which can be archaic as well as modern as well. Uh, known from sites like Irhoud and uh, going back to about 3,000 years. Even here in Africa, uh, the, the, the Middle Paleolithic uh, <clears throat> or the emergence of modern humans was uh, dated to about 200,000 years or 195,000 years for a very, very long time. And uh, it was again thought East Africa was the region where the early um, you know, evolution of modern Homo sapiens also occurred. But you know, in the recent past, in the last uh, seven, eight years or so, uh, some of these sites, Moroccan sites, have contributed to the older uh, evidence of, uh, you know, uh, anatomically modern human uh, fossils. And then even in uh, Tanzania, we have a site going back to 400,000 and so on. So this is the time range. And perhaps even in Africa, the transition from later Shulian to early Middle, middle Stone Age uh, uh, can also go backwards in time, like we have this kind of uh, situation in Athirampakkam, where you know the Middle Paleolithic is extended back to about almost 400,000 years ago. It is possible. Uh, we cannot rule out the chances, but it is only a matter of time. And then, uh, uh, so that this uh, you know evidence that is there from different parts of uh, you know South Asia and Africa, and of course uh, you know the Southwest Asian region, which is one critical geographical region, perhaps that was the crossroads. Uh, during the course of uh, human expansion out of Africa into other parts of uh, the old world and then beyond. So uh, next one. So uh, here I would like to <clears throat> come to the area which is more familiar to me and where we were able to produce the first uh, you know, uh, date for the Middle Paleolithic um, going back, absolute date for the Middle Paleolithic going back to almost 80,000 years ago onwards. And this is an area called uh, Jureru Valley. Um, in, in this southwestern part of the modern Karnool district in Andhra Pradesh, and it is also a geological basin. And we identify this basin as one of the refugias uh, in India, where we have a continuous uh, sequence of, uh, you know, uh, Paleolithic and uh, <clears throat> Mesolithic and later cultures, very well preserved, um, you know, uh, in the very variety of geomorphic context in here. So this is a site where. Uh, the Middle Paleolithic is associated with uh, the, the volcanic ash deposit dating back to about 74,000 years ago. Uh, the, the cultural data uh, ranges in time from early Paleolithic to uh, you know, Iron Age and even later Trim periods and so on. But most interesting uh, you know, feature about this particular region is uh, the series of localities uh, giving us very clear evidence of the preservation of artifactual material uh, going back to Middle Paleolithic times, uh, and they are associated with these, uh, you know, fluvial uh, deposits. And some of the sections that are shown here between these two hill ranges here, uh, these are all quaternary sections. And then the volcanic ash, which is preserved here, these are all composite sections, no doubt, uh, little logs, no doubt. But we have the evidence of Middle Paleolithic occurring about a meter below the base of this volcanic ash. Uh, this is about 2.5 uh, meters of volcanic ash, but all that is not the primary ash. Uh, the base, uh, we have about 10 to 15 meters of the primary ash, and then it has been reworked uh, from the surrounding upland areas and then got, got deposited into the, you know, the, the base of this particular valley, which was a large water body at the time 
of uh, the ash fall. And so it got emplaced into and developed an artificial thickness about uh, 2.5 meters uh, plus thickness. But this has now been very clearly dated. And this is not the only site in India where we have this uh, Engestoba tuff. It has been widespread from Western India to Central India to Southeastern India and so on. And uh, compares very well with the, the, the Engestoba tuff found in Sumatra and Arabian Sea, Indian Ocean course and so on. So uh, as far as uh, the, the identification of the ash and the age of the ash, there is no doubt about, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, uh, these two aspects and importance in establishing the chronology of the Paleolithic cultures. So since the middle Paleolithic artifacts come from an horizon well, far below the base of the volcanic ash, we have OSL dates here and uh, it confirms uh, the younger age for the ash, about 74,000 years. So this particular context uh, has facilitated in, you know, initiating debate about um, you know, origins of modern humans into the Indian subcontinent. Uh, I have a enlarged uh, you know, chart of this particular slide, I will show again. So the context, as I said, in that small area of about 2,000 acres, we have found so many number of uh, middle Paleolithic and Acheulean and then uh, uh, Neolithic and then post-Neolithic settlements and so on. So we have a couple of sites uh, associated uh, with the reworked uh, colluvial deposits uh, in the upslopes along the hill ranges here, where we have Ashulian artifacts coming from this particular horizon. Next one. Yeah, these are some of the artifacts that we see. Yeah, and so I was talking about this Enges Toba tuff and uh, uh, <clears throat> below this particular material, uh, that we see in this section, we have the middle Paleolithic. Next one. So this uh, volcanic ash deposit here, and then uh, the, uh, you the know, fluvial silts, and then you have a channel lag gravel here. And uh, along with this particular lag gravel, we come across uh, these uh, mid fresh uh, middle Paleolithic flake, uh, retest flake artifacts, and then uh, the OSL dates, and then the base of the 74,000 year cache. So this is where, for the first time, we dated uh, the middle Paleolithic to about 80,000 years ago onwards and began to argue because of their comparability with the African Middle Stone Age. And the fact that African Middle Stone Age roughly coincides with, nearly coincides with the early emergence of anatomically modern humans, we thought that between Africa and the you know, Indian subcontinent, uh, this comparability is suggestive of the fact that there is a link between population movements originating in Africa and gra gradually, you know, colonizing southern parts of the Indian Peninsula and so on. Artifacts were made from quartzite, from, you know, crystalline silica, as well as uh, siliceous limestone and so on. So most of the localities which were excavated in this area have consistently given as evidence of uh, uh, these middle Paleolithic artifacts coming from a deposit which is older than 74,000 years. Next one. Another view of the sections, different localities, and one of the lithologs that we have has produced a, a clear picture of the uh, quaternary stratigraphy. And so we have the dates here going back to 77,000 uh, years, and then you have the middle Paleolithic material, and then the volcanic ash, and then upwards uh, in the stratigraphy, we also see continuation of uh, flake tools, you know, <clears throat> not so, not in the areas where we um, excavated, not in all the trenches where we were excavating, but in a couple of trenches, we also found continuation of middle Paleolithic, uh, even above the volcanic ash deposit. Next one. Uh, one second, huh. no, in previous. Okay, okay, leave, go back. Next. All right. So, uh, as I said, we have been on the lookout for, you know, clear evidence of hominin fossils in India. Uh, way back in the 1880s, uh, the first attempt was made by Robert Brucefoot. You know, the limestone caves in the Karnal region are very, very potential. And they have been proved time and again that they are potential for, you know, reconstructing prehistory of the region. Uh, Foot had, uh, you know, initiated work in order to look for evidence of uh, early hominin remains. 
And then subsequently, when we started working, before our work at Jalapuram was very, very productive, our initial surveys were again in these cave areas because uh, between Foot and our team working in this area, several other archaeologists have been revisiting these sites. And each time they reported the presence of uh, evidence for you know, lithic artifacts as well as bone tools and so on. Uh, and then they suggested that this could be uh, Upper Paleolithic and so on. And uh, even Foot had referred to them as Magdalenian uh, blade tools or bone tools and so on. But then so far, uh, you know, it has been very, very frustrating for archaeologists who have been working in these cave areas. There is a possibility uh, that the deposits go much deeper. We have not yet reached the bedrock in these caves, but yet these are the areas where uh, we think that uh, one day, uh, in future, we will be able to, you know, encounter the presence of hominin fossils and so on. Next one. So, but this, uh, you know, this cave area, uh, the cave floor deposits have also been very well established because since the time of Robert Brustwood, a large <clears throat> assemblage of animal fossils have been recovered. And uh, recent work has clearly shown, uh, this is again a composite stratigraphy and uh, one of these deposits yielded the presence of, uh, you know, uh, volcanic glass shards, uh, you know, if it's uh, same 74,000 year old youngest Toba tuff, glass shards preserved in this particular uh, litho unit in, this, in the cave floor sequence here. And then we have also obtained the OSL dates. And this has helped us in establishing continuity of, uh, you know, animal population, animal fauna during the last uh, 200,000 years ago or so. So it is possible that you know, this cave floor deposits hold a lot of potential for further investigation and go deeper and deeper. And cave floor deposits are generally very, very thick. And so we need to have a lot of patience and go down the, to the bedrock and see if uh, we are lucky to encounter hominin remains and so on. It has also been possible because of the chronology that has been uh, built up for this uh, stratigraphy uh, to correlate uh, them with these, uh, you know, isotopic stages. So going backwards in time up to MIS-7, uh, so is the possibility. That is one advancement uh, in our, you know, investigations into these cave floor deposits in southern India. Next one. Uh, more importantly, yeah. <clears throat> This is that rock shelter, uh, one of the rock shelters, which again, uh, for the first time produced a date of uh, 35,000 years or slightly more for the oldest uh, and long enduring microlithic technology in the Indian subcontinent. So until then, uh, the site of uh, Patne and the site of Mahitakedi was also known to be, uh, you know, you know uh, a older microlithic site, but absolute dates were not published. So the Patne had remained in isolation. So this, uh, this work uh, at uh, Jalapuram 9 Rock Shelter uh, enabled, uh, enabled us to produce OSL dates as well as AMS radiocarbon dates and also recover a variety of uh, material cultural remains, including symbolic artifacts and so on. Fragments of human cranial fossils have been also found, but not very well preserved, but they are in the time range from 12 to 18,000 years time bracket. So late Pleistocene context is no doubt uh, ruled out. So there are such numerous uh, huge uh, painted rock shelters in the landscape, as you can see here. They are all, uh, you know, several hundred uh, rock shelters were documented by our work. And one of these rock shelters was selected for test fitting uh, because the density of uh, face uh, scatter of artifacts is very, very high. Every piece of stone lying on the floor is in an artifact here. And so it was decided that we take a trench, uh, go down to the base of this rock shelter and then see what can be documented in terms of evidence of human activity and relate the art act activity with the presence of humans here. So very hard calcareous deposit yet, you know, it's so hard to dig through, but we were able to go down about uh, 3.5 meters and recover systematically. Next. See, systematic, uh, you know, evidence for, you know, fluted core technology, the antler, uh, you know, serial harpoons, and then the microblades uh, dating back to about 34,000 years ago. And then, uh, you know, technical, technological transition is clearly seen uh, in the archaeological record that has been uh, systematically, you know, documented from all the localities uh, in this 2000, 2000 acres area in the Jureru Valley of, uh, you know, Karnul district. 
So the base of this rock shelter has given a date of about 35,000 years ago. So you have this kernel, uh, you know, limestone. Most of these artifacts are made from very silicious, highly silicious limestone. And you have chert, quartzite. But quartzite is not used in the microlithic. Uh, but chert and chalcedony and, my, you know, very fine-grained limestone, uh, silicious limestone have been, you know, uh, used for making microliths. So this next, next, yeah, one more. Uh -huh. So uh, yes, this is the uh, in a most exciting part of uh, our excavation at Jalapuram Nine. Gave clear evidence of uh, the, my, the oldest beads uh, in the archaeological context. Uh, slightly uh, burnt uh, cranial fragments of a young, young child, and then you know, uh, you know, serial harpoon. Now, and then of course uh, shells, all of them coming from a well-defined archeological context and they range in time, but their presence of uh, behavioral modernity is very, very clean, clearly seen in this record. And we have this uh, evidence, similar evidence coming from already well excavated sites like Batadamba Lena, Patna in India, and of course, Jalapuram. So you have these shell beads and limestone beads uh, and also uh, all and such other you know, objects associated with uh, behavioral modernity is very clearly seen in this uh, rock shelter excavation. Next one. So what we are trying to show here is that <clears throat> right from early Paleolithic times to uh, you know late Paleolithic times, but here from the excavated context, we have uh, before 34,000 years ago to till about 80,000 years ago, we have these assemblages and then suddenly from 34,000 years ago or further up in time we have changed in uh, you know the assemblage characteristics so microlithic technology dominates from the time about 34,000 years ago and then gradually as you can see go back in time you have the middle paleolithic assemblages so these are some of the uh, distinctive distinctive tool types that have been uh, recorded from you know the technological and typological analysis that have been carried out and then their presence uh, in higher frequency in the lower and their lo lower frequency in the upper but increasing frequency of microblades microblade cores and backed artifacts and then high quality raw material usage you know shift from limestone to gradual shift into cryptocrystalline silica and then these other uh, gradually we see also their presence and then bipolar technology uh, seen in this area. And this is where we have argued for <clears throat> continuity of modern human populations right from uh, middle Paleolithic times into the late uh, Paleolithic times in, in, in this particular uh, you know, part of uh, Southern India. I could have discussed more about it, but for one tough time, I think I should uh, stop here. And then uh, thank you very much for your kind attention as well as to our colleagues here. Thank you there so are much. Questions. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Ravi Kori It was an enlightening uh, talk and it's always uh, uh, really uh, happy to listen to you and to learn much, much more. And it's, it was a very good uh, summary of uh, all the studies that have been carried out in terms of human dispersals and I hope uh, there, there are a lot of questions and we can take it uh, one when I request Sharda to uh, kind of put forward the questions to Professor Ravi Kori Shetan. Okay, sir. So we have around three to four that we can address straight away. Um, the first one is by uh, Ajay Pratap who asks, are there any models for the lateral expansion of modern humans within India? What is the question, please? Um, are there any models for the lateral expansion of modern humans within India? Whether in terms of fossils or in terms of lithic uh, assemblages? Well, that he has not Because we have wide, widespread occurrence of uh, middle Paleolithic sites. We have widespread rock shelter sites, wherein we have microthic assemblages, which come from undated context as well, right from Vindhyas in the area where you have been working, uh, you know, Ajay. Some of the rock shelters which you where you are looking for, you know, rock art and so on, can also be investigated uh, to examine their potential for identifying, um, you know, the occupations ranging uh, in time backwards into later Pleistocene and so on. So it is possible; it cannot be ruled out. But as of today, we do not have 
we do not know about more sites uh, you know, reflecting on lateral expansion of modern moderns in, in the indian subcontinent but for all that we need you know well defined archaeological investigations with good control especially dating control and uh, controlled sampling and so on and so forth it is possible to establish that okay so the next one is uh, by tosavanta who asks what are the new areas that you recommend that uh, where young scholars can work to find human fossils in india uh, i i i try to advocate the most potential areas uh, which i have called core areas or otherwise refugias and you know in order to minimize efforts and uh, you know uh, be, be very very efficient in terms of uh, productivity if you can concentrate efforts in some of those refugias it is possible for us to you know uh, you know come out with tantalizing results uh, and it is it is i think uh, instead of going about you know wild goose stage we can limit our uh, you know efforts to well defined very potential areas which have been identified i may uh, i may I refer you to my paper called basin model uh, published in 2007 and if you need uh, access to that i may also email you okay um so next one is by parth who asks uh, what do you think is the reason for the lack of assemblages resembling upper paleolithic technology in jurero valley uh upper paleolithic uh, by what definition if you adhere to european definition upper paleolithic is very different but in some literature even aurignacian is called upper paleolithic whereas uh, pre aurignacian is referred to as neanderthal middle paleolithic and so on various stages of development but we need to redefine our assemblages uh, in the light of modern developments and i think there is need for overhaul of chronology in the indian subcontinent which you are very well aware so he says uh, so by upper paleolithic he he's referring to a culture without with large blades and without microliths if i am right yes that is you know the early reports of upper paleolithic in india you may be aware of those some of those sites but then we need to reexamine because they are not from controlled excavations all those upper paleolithic sites so far reported are from either river gravel or surface occurrences so from stratified context we have not been able to you know identify the presence of typical upper paleolithic that you are referring to uh, ajay pratap has one more question he says okay. how is a refugia to be defined what exactly is it a refugia is an area you know like you know there is a perennial resource space whether it is water whether there is lithic raw material uh, you know india is a subcontinent which is not uh, governed by glacial uh, you know advances or something like that it is generally covered by monsoon uh, circulation system and this monsoon circulation uh, you know goes uh, back in time uh, to as early as 15 million years ago and so on this monsoon circulation has controlled the availability of fresh water resources and then you we already have a fairly good idea of the preferred lithic raw materials and you know these geographical provinces where you have this uh, variety of cryptocrystalline silica as well as quartzites and compact basalts and so on and the present distribution of these uh, paleolithic sites across the indian subcontinent shows relative spatial variation in the density of sites so the refugias like i have identified as basin models like vindhyas in central india you know like gondwan of uh, basins in andhra pradesh in uh, in southeast india in tamil nadu or the kalagi and bhima basins where you have this great cluster of sites uh, in the you know hunsky valley sites or kalagi uh, malaprabha valley sites these are some of the uh, refugias and these refugias are uh, very well covered by both northeast and uh, southwest monsoons and during the uh, glacial arid conditions northeast monsoons are uh, stronger uh, whereas the southwest monsoons are weaker so this may alter the availability of surf surface water resources but these basins because of their peculiar topography they had uh, uh, ground water resources reservoirs and these reservoirs and high water tables uh, given the situation when you are talking about a time period several uh, tens of thousands of years ago with little demographic imp impact and the productivity of these basins was never altered and that is why i suggest some of these basins as potential areas 
And if we can minimize our survey efforts and then investigations, uh, we will be much more successful. For example, there are rock shelters, there are uh, caves, and then of course, open air uh, you know, stations that we have documented. So Karnur Subbasin is part of the larger Kadapa Basin. And you have here a variety of geomorphic uh, you know, features which have preserved evidence of hominin adaptation to that particular landscape. So this is a, a potential areas. Of course, it does not mean rule out the possibility of finding sites outside these basins, but in order to be able to more productive and uh, you know, uh, uh, employ modern methods of uh, both field as well as the laboratory techniques, uh, these are the potential areas. Um, Ambili Ananova asks, from which area or region could early hominins have potentially entered the Indian subcontinent, specifically uh, what about the Potwar region and which are the types of tools that are found in Pabbi Hills? Yeah, they are mode one artifacts. They are flake artifacts, uh, Pabbi Hill region. They are not typical by faces, but in the neighborhood of this region, we have the oldest Ashulian sites represented by you know Dina and Jalalpur and those sites, but they are in the time range of about 700 to 800,000 years ago. But these two sites, like Pabbi Hills and Rivard sites, uh, they have non-diagnostic artifacts. That is why two million years, 1.8 to 2.2 million years time bracket, and possibly intercontinental routes, northern route. Otherwise, it's not the coastal route. And coastal routes hypothesis is only uh, emphasized in the context of modern human expansion uh, associated with microlithic invention. So the argument is that the microliths provided uh, technological capability to these, uh, you know, <clears throat> hominins who are going along the southern coastal route were exposed to uniform subsistence resources, be it aquatic or you know, land-based, you know, subsistence resources. And that is where Southern Dispersal Route has been advocated. But it does not hold good because we have lots of sites of, uh, you know, comparable sites, even in the inland areas. And I suggest, uh, I, I suspect most of the, you know, expansions into the Indian subcontinent took place through the Northern routes via these famous passes like uh, Khyber and Bolan and so on and so forth. And some of the Rajasthan area is, is drawing blank as of now. But there are in the subsurface context, there are quite a large number of sites which can throw certainly more light on the dispersal routes of uh, these early hominins, either during the lower Paleolithic or during the middle Paleolithic and later. Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, Selva Kumar Veera Sami asks why Nisik areas, though they have large number of rock shelters, were not a preferred landscape. Was Where? it only Nisik? Um, the, the oh, Nisik, huh? Nisik the rock, shelters, rock shelters in uh, these Purana go basins are very different from rock shelters in the Nisik areas. I said the, the Nisik areas, as we have been discussing in the context of Neolithic uh, adaptations, they are associated with a, a very resource poor you know, geological environment. Whereas these quartzitic landscapes are very rich in, you know, resources other than other than lithic raw material resources, these these landscapes were more suitable for perennial sources of water in the form of uh, you know uh, pools and ponds, which were uh, fed by you know. Uh, in the in the Nisic areas. And that is one reason why the rock shelters in uh, in quartzite sands are much more potential than the, you know, and so far we have not documented a uh, Paleolithic context in, uh, in the Nisic areas, especially rock shelter context in the Nisic areas. Uh, yeah. okay, we have a few more. Um, yeah. Parth asks, what, what do you think may be the reason for absence of Paleolithic evidence in Northeastern India, despite the presence of raw materials and um, other resources? I, 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 I always suspected this dense forest ecosystems were coming in the way and uh, the productivity of forest ecosystems in the secondary productivity, primary productivity are the factors which we have taken into account. As I mentioned in the beginning, uh, the, the, the region, Southern Europe below 40 degrees latitude was uh, more favorable for human colonization uh, early in the lower Pleistocene is because of the secondary productivity because plant food resources, because grasslands are more productive and, uh, you know, the biomass, secondary biomass is much more, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, plenty in those areas. So forested ecosystems are not favorable. And I know, I know in, in some areas in northeastern India, uh, there are these uh, Gondwana exposures, and there is occasional report of the presence of biphases. Uh, I I'm not go, I'm not having full details of the fine spots and so on, but there is a report coming from far northeast of uh, uh, you know in northeast India. Uh, okay, so Professor Jeevan Karakwal he asks, um, there are two questions. One is what is the origin of the toba ash, and then he says. Uh, do we have non-Ashulian sites in India? Yeah, uh, Toba ash is, is sources in Sumatra. This is the most uh, you know, powerful explosion uh, the last two million years of geological history. It's covered on uh, widespread over most part of uh, Southeast Asia, South China Sea, and up to East Africa. Uh, the ash has uh, covered the region. Uh, and the, the presence of this ash has been noted in the Bay of Bengal course, Arabian Sea course, and then uh, North, India, North Indian Ocean course and so on. So it has its source in Sumatra. And uh, the ash uh, samples uh, you know, collected from sites from you know, terrestrial context in India, peninsular India, and also ocean core uh, you know, deposits uh, compare very well geochemical comparison, organ-organ dating, fission track dating, all methods multiple methods of dating and the geochemical fingerprinting has been carried out and uh, they very well match with the 74,000 year uh, eruption uh, that took, occurred in, in the Sumatra Toba caldera. And the non Acheulean sites, as I mentioned, it is the Pubby Hill and uh, you know uh, this one. And of course, Parth can also co comment on this because he has been working at one site in the Narmada Valley. Uh, also, uh, the work of Armand and Katri in the Narmada Valley, there is uh, there are some uh, you know suggestions of uh, for the presence of uh, pre ashulian uh, in that particular region, but I think they need to be revisited. Yeah. Okay, and um, so there's uh, a Saurav Lai asks in Jwalapuram Valley, what is the significance of volcanic ash with the Middle Paleolithic settlements, and what about the large water bodies? Please explain um, these two. Can you repeat? There was a break yeah. in your voice. In the, in the Jwalapuram Valley, hmm. what is the significance of volcanic ash with the Middle Paleolithic set settlements, and what about the large water bodies? Please explain. So could you hear me? Um, he's frozen. Yeah. And we are in the distal area of this volcanic uh, ash fall, and it had a minimal effect, and it did not have any effect on the populations which were living there. And so there was no such bottleneck, uh, you know, caused by the ash fall in this area. Although the surface water resources were polluted because of uh, the increase in the sulfur dioxide and such other things as a result of ash fall. Uh, but then uh, the immediate emplacement of uh, this ash into the basin, uh, into the valley floor of the basin. Uh, and then the valley sites, which are covered by hill ranges, were very, very rich in uh, groundwater spring activity. So the hominins which were living in this area were least affected by the, you know, <clears throat> drastic effects of the ash fall, and they continue to be there. They had access to raw material resources, they had access to freshwater resources, and so uh, it did not uh, create any, uh, you know, problem for the life of uh, the middle Paleolithic uh, hominins living in that area. So water bodies have been there. It is a very low energy, uh, you know, drainage basin, uh, vast, uh, you know, la large, uh, low, shallow pools and ponds existed uh, in the valley floor. And of course, springs, springs were very, very active. And uh, you know, they provided uh, continuous supply of water. And as a result, uh, the subsistence base was not altered uh, for the hominins living here. OK, I think we can take one last question. Yeah. Um, one second, sir. So um, this is an anonymous attendee who asks, do we have silkrete? Artifacts in India, I have not heard about it, but in Australia, these raw materials are seen a lot. What is the similar uh, kind of material we see in the Indian subcontinent? 
Silkrete. <laughs> Silkrete, Alcrete, Calcrete, they are all duricrous and uh, they have different chemical compositions. Silkrete is dominated by silica. Uh, like ferricrete, uh, which is not useful for making artifacts. But then I have a couple of, uh, you know, uh, examples from uh, Western India, Kutch region, where they have reported the presence of silkrete artifacts. And perhaps uh, you may have access to them if you can contact Professor Ajit Prasad and his students. All right. So I think uh, we have covered most of the relevant questions. Maybe one last question. Uh, uh, the question by Arvinder Kaur, why Africa was the home to the evolution of hominids? Why not some other region? <laughs> what about into, yeah. into India or... Uh, out of India. Out uh, of India models, yes. You see, all the existing models are based on the evidence at our disposal and the dates that we have for the evidence that we have. So the models can change. Uh, the source of origin can also change if we can produce. That is why I showed you the second or third slide, the traveling hominins. You see, we have older dates, no doubt, outside of Africa, but they are not even the new discoveries in Africa are taking you know, the evidence even backwards in time. So come out with evidence, then we can certainly, these are not rigid models. You know, we can anytime change them. So that is the argument here. So all, all options are open. Provided you go out and then look for sites and establish a chronology older than in Africa. Uh, and I think yeah. uh, the last one probably, which yeah. I think many of us are curious about, is uh, yeah. why we don't find enough uh, so, hominin fossils in India. Yeah, I have one simple explanation. Uh, as I said, water tables were much high across the entire peninsula. And water saturated conditions were not favorable for fossilization. Mm -hmm. And if you have a desiccating subsoil environment, it is possible for petrification of, uh, you know, faunal material. This is one explanation I have given in my, you know, basin model paper. Uh, uh, that is one way, because we are looking at the modern landscapes and trying to extra extrapolate them into back in time. But actually present is not necessarily key to the past when it comes to understanding landforms and landform features. So these paleogeographic conditions are, are very, very different, uh, you know, several thousands of years ago. So like I said, you know, in the granitic area and then in, uh, you know, uh, the quartzitic area, the landscapes were always, uh, you know, supported by uh, groundwater resources and not the surface drainage. Surface drainage did not matter whether, you know, there was regularity in terms of monsoon circulation over a given area or not. But once the aquifers were rich and water tables were not altered because there was very little demographic pressure on groundwater water resources. So naturally springs were active. You come into this granitic Nisic area, even 50 years ago, there were active springs in the Inselbergs where we have early Neolithic settlements located. But in the last 200 years and ago, you know, the increasingly water tables have been going down and down. They reached as abyssal depths like 500, 800 feet and so on. So that is the modern demographic, uh, you know, influence or uh, pressure on these natural resources, non-renewable resources. It's not, you know, possible to, you know, there is disproportionate relationship between, you know, monsoon recharge and the exploitation of groundwater resources. So that is the reason. Uh, so that that in the in the Pleistocene, major part of the Indian uh, you know peninsula was a wetland area, and these were wetland adaptations basically, and water resources were plenty, and only in the later Pleistocene context in calcine you know subsurface environments we have greater chances for petrification. So you as I mentioned in the in the Bilasargam cave, a calcine cave floor environment has preserved you know thousands of animal fossils. Same is the situation in the sub -Himalaya. Same is the situation in the late quaternary deposits along the fluvial uh, systems uh, in, in India. That is the point. But it, it, can, it can be tested. My, my hypothesis can be tested. I think we are done with the questions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Ravi Kurisetter. It was a wonderful talk and uh, I really thank on behalf of Archaeological Sciences Center, uh, IIT Gandhinagar for sparing uh, a valuable time and re-enlightening us.
I look forward for more talks from you and also wider sure. collaborations. And we can. Uh, I I was very very is very very nervous when you told me three hundred people have registered. <laughs> I don't know how many attended. No, at uh, maximum I was noticing around hundred and fifteen. Hundred and fifteen. Hundred and fifteen. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so I much. Thank, I thank you. I thank you for having considered me. And, uh, I could do some blah blah. Uh, and uh, I, I always take an opportunity to project the work we have done in Karnool Basin. That's an amazing work. Amazing. Thank you, everybody. Michelle, Sharda, and you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you.